very strange year in sports it has been. Without a doubt, 2020 will go down as not only a year we'll all remember, but also a year we'd like to forget when it comes to sports. Absolutely, Lily. While professional sports and colleges are getting back onto the field, that's not the way it for us in the high schools. Like I said, a year to forget. Hi, I'm Tom Morrow. And I'm Lily Epes. The last time you may have seen Sports Talk was last May, where seniors and b, &B founders Rocco and Casey were leading the way. But Rocco and Casey have both graduated. Congratulations to them. So now, it's time for b, &B the next generation of Sports Talk. Lily, it's our show, and this year, we've got a lot of new features and surprises. That's right, Tom. Last year, you were the midweek update sports host, and we both did some play-by-play. -play. But now we've been trusted with b, b Sports Talk. We've got some big shoes to fill. True. And it's not easy to fill these shoes in a COVID-19 world with no high school sports to talk about, but I, th but I think we're up to the task. So, what do you discuss on a sports talk show with no high school sports to cover? Well, that's exactly where we start. BNB's AJ Freed has a report on how COVID-19 has upset the world of high school sports in New York State and here at Mepham. High school sports for many students has been a way to express themselves, whether it's on the field or the court. Sports has always held many opportunities for high school students. With the 2020 fall sports season being canceled, many student athletes have had their own personal thoughts. I think it's, it's weird because I've played sports my whole life, so now finally we're not playing sports at all. And then I also think it's weird because we're all in school anyway. I mean, this Friday we're all going to go back to school full time, and the fact that we can walk in the halls together and be in class together so close and then not even go outside for sports after school, I just think it's stupid. Well, you know, full sports was just a big part of all my high school life, so it really has a deep impact on me that it being canceled. And I know I can speak for pretty much everybody else that plays full sport, that everybody can say that it just sucks. There's nothing to do about it. Besides student athletes, coaches and team staffs have their own thoughts. Um, well, you know, obviously it was disappointing to get the news that, um, you know, that we weren't going to start on on um, September 21st, after the after the governor had announced that you know it, it was okay to resume, um, you know it's a, it's a little bit different than a full cancellation because the plan is still you know to move forward with the fall season um, at a later date. You know, granted, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, and it's certainly not ideal, but um, you know there there is a little bit of a, a, a positive in that we're still hard at work trying to figure out a, a way to, to make the fall season happen. It's unfortunate times here in the high school sports world. We wish we were able to watch football, soccer, and volleyball, but until further notice, we will just have to wait patiently for the hopeful return. For BMB, I'm AJ Freed. Lily, what is it like being an athlete and not being able to play with seniors? You know, not being able to play with seniors is really unfortunate because one of the best parts of being part of a varsity program is being with those older girls because you look up to them. You know, I played in eighth grade, so seeing those older girls playing and dominating the field, it was really cool to see them. And you know, everyone looks forward to their senior year, so you want to see those seniors go out. And that was one thing that we didn't get to do last season, which was really unfortunate. But hopefully this year we get to play and we'll be able to see those seniors, you know? All right. So Tom, as yourself a spring athlete, what was it like missing your season last year? Well, it was tough to say, Lily. Uh, we had one week of tryouts, and that was really it. Uh, that Friday, we got the notice if we made the team or not, and uh, I actually did. So we were coming back Saturday, but Friday afternoon, uh, we sort of got the, we, we, we got the notice that the school shut down. So, you know... There was, like, afterwards, you know, there was no Saturday, so it was tough. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Not being able to play your season, it was just, like, taken away from you. Right. And, you know, Lily, what about you? What did you miss most about the non-existent season? About the non-existent season, it was definitely that last year was our year to go to states, you know? So the previous season, we made it to Long Island, and we won counties for the first time in the program history of softball so not being able to have that opportunity to compete in states and maybe even take home a title that was really hard to see that slip away from us you know what I mean right 100 percent 
So with New York State joining Nassau County and postponing the sports season, what do you think will happen to the three sport athletes? It's tough to say, Lily. Um, what New York State is currently doing is they're taking three compressed seasons and like kind of pushing it all into the spring. So uh, the fall is actually going to start off right in January to February. And uh, okay. it's going to be tough. And, uh, you know, no one ever wanted this, but it's going to be tough for athletes to navigate their way through three compressed seasons. And, you know, Lily, sure. what if there is no fall season? You know, seniors, football homecoming, pep rally, all of this stuff is all in the fall. And, you mm -hmm. know, how does this impact campus life for athletes and non-athletes? You know, for athletes, like we said, the seniors, some of them will not be able to play this fall season. And for some athletes, this is their main sport. So everyone looks forward to their senior season. So that really is unfortunate for those seniors who this is their main sport. But besides from that, for campus life, everyone looks forward to homecoming and pep rally and football games during the fall. But as of now, that's not happening. So it's really unfortunate that we don't get to go to those football games or those festivities. Luckily, Lily, me and you both have a couple more years here at MEPM. That means a couple more homecomings, but a lot of questions indeed. Like everything else, I guess we're just going to have to take things one day at a time as we look forward. With so much uncertainty looking ahead, we here at BNB Sports Talk figured we'd take a look back. A look back into the great names that played here at MEPM in the past. We walk past the athletic trophy case every time we pass the main office. But how often do we take a look to see who of those great athletes of the past were? In a new segment called Faces in the Cases, we do just that. Fielder Morris is. He went to the wall and then he came back. Boy, he's a good player. My uh, junior year, um, we were playing in the Nassau County playoffs in, in the baseball field in the back there at Mepham. And we were playing East Meadow. And Frank Viola, who went on to pitch 15 years in the big leagues, who's a good friend of mine, uh, him and I hooked up in the first round of the county playoffs. And there were several thousand people there. From the backfields of Met High School to center field for the St. Louis Cardinals, John Morris's journey has taken him far from the halls of Mepham, where his picture hangs in the case outside the attendance office. I graduated in 1979. Uh, I, I love the academic experience I had there. I had great teachers, but uh, I really enjoyed uh, playing baseball and, and soccer. They were, they were great experiences for me in terms of teaching team building learning how to compete on a daily basis. So I'm really grateful for the overall experience I had. I had great friends, great teachers, great classmates. The journey to the pitcher's mound from here in Belmore to center field in the World Series took many twists and turns. Moore started playing center field at Seton Hall University, where he blossomed as a ball player to the highly competitive Cape Cod League. And the beginning was very difficult. And I realized after a couple of weeks that the players really weren't any better than me. And, um, Six weeks later, I wound up uh, being the MVP of the league, and, and in my mind, I figured it out that, you know, I'm, I'm as good as these guys, and that really uh, catapulted me as far as the following year was concerned, knowing that, that I could play professional. John Morris was named Cape Cod League MVP in 1981, with two home runs, 37 runs batted in, and a 410 batting average. Then in 1982, the majors came calling when the Kansas City Royals made him the 10th overall pick in the first round in the amateur draft. Yeah, it was really awesome um, playing in the 1987 World Series. I, I made the last out of game six, and uh, that's one of the few negative moments I have about yeah. my playing career. Uh, it, it's hard to erase that, uh, but to get as far as we did that year, we won the National League Eastern Division. We beat the New York Mets in a very close race. We beat the San Francisco Giants for the National League Championship, and we went to seven games in the World Series. So uh, 
great experience, wouldn't trade it for anything. I'm very proud of the fact that we had four players in the 1987 World Series that were from Long Island. Three that uh, were neighbors of mine, Frank, myself from North Belmore, Gene Larkin from North Belmore, who went to Chaminade High School. Uh, he lived three blocks from me, he lived on Belmore Road. And Frank Viola lived in East Meadow. We had a fourth player out from uh, Suffolk County, Sal Butera. So four guys that played in the 87 World Series. Uh, that's the first thing I tell everybody about, about how cool that was. Once his playing career was done, Morris returned to school to fulfill a promise he made to his mother. So I got to play professionally until I was 32. And then from there, I uh, went back and got my degree at Seton Hall University. And I finished that up as a, as a promise I made to my mom. Then it was on to coaching and managing and eventually scouting at a job in the Reds front office where today John Morris works as a special assistant to the general manager and later this year he'll be inducted into the New York State Baseball Hall of Fame. After all of that, what advice does he have for young people today? It's really important to have uh, an understanding of, of, of what it is to compete and, and what it takes to to be successful at whatever it is you choose to do, but also learn how to deal with failure. Because a lot of the things that we aspire to be good at, uh, unfortunately, we have to deal with obstacles, detours, roadblocks, setbacks along the way. And it's almost like we need to have a short memory. in that we're going to experience obstacles, but we need to be able to get over them quickly so that we don't get bogged down in the, in the setbacks and the negativity and that we can just plow our way through. For BNB, I'm Tom Morrow. Joining us for this episode's The View, 1979 MEP graduate, John Morris. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So, John, we just watched your faces in the cases package where you talked about fr facing Frank Viola in the Nassau County Championship. Frank was originally a, uh, he pitched three years at St. John's. He was a second round draft pick out of the, from the Minnesota Twins in 1981. He pitched in the College World Series. Um, you know, Frank was the guy that I could never beat. I couldn't beat him in middle school. I couldn't beat him at Mepham. I couldn't beat him in the minor leagues. I couldn't beat him in the major leagues. And then he even beats me in the World Series in 1987 when I was with St. Louis and he was with Minnesota. But uh, we laugh about it. He's a good friend. Uh, he, he's had an amazing career. How did you wind up going from being an all-time Long Island top pitcher to starting as an outfielder in college? Well, I came up uh, as a pitcher. Um, I actually, I have to admit to you too, I wasn't even going to play baseball in high school. I actually uh, was going to run track. Uh, Jerusalem Avenue and Mepham at the time had fantastic track programs. And my brother, I had an older brother who uh, was two years older than me. And his senior year, I just decided, yeah, he's going to be a senior. I'll be a sophomore. Uh, maybe I'll. Uh, I'll play one year of baseball with him before he graduates. And I really liked it. And I, I came up mostly as a pitcher. I, I didn't figure out this hitting thing until I got to college. So I, when I went from pitching, I was recruited to go to Seton Hall as a pitcher. And then I, I figured out a lot of things uh, offensively and with my batting once I got to Seton Hall University. While you were in college, we saw you got the opportunity to play in the Cape Cod League, where you were the MVP. And you said you were intimidated by these other players in big name schools. Yeah, I think we, you know, we all have experiences where we're held back by our, uh, our inner fears and our negative thoughts that we have about ourselves. And once we realize that when we start to compete with other people that we're, we're really, uh, we're, we're better than we give ourselves credit for in a, in a lot of respects. We're smarter than we think we are. We're uh, more talented than we give ourselves credit for. And it really, it's just a matter of getting over those mental obstacles that get in our way. After playing college ball, the MLB was right in your rearview mirror. 
In June 1982, it was draft day and you were selected 10th overall by the Kansas City Royals in the first round. What was your reaction at that moment? I remember playing, I was playing basketball in the school gym and I was waiting around. There was no internet at the time. There were no cell phones. Uh, so I, <clears throat> I was not even home in North Elmore. My mom was there. And I actually got a phone call from her to the, uh, the office at the university, the athletic department. And my uh, coach came running down to tell me that, hey, you've been drafted by Kansas City in the first round. So it was great. It, the information, uh, the sharing of information took a little bit longer than it does now. You know, I couldn't turn on right. Twitter or Instagram. And, and get there wasn't any social media back then. No, no, no it, was, yeah. it, was, it was much different. I never say it was better or worse. I just say it's different. You, we can all uh, interpret it however we want. But uh, I, I was very grateful for that day. It was a, a moment I, I, I won't forget. Um, it was really the beginning uh, of a, what's almost been a 40-year career. After a career in and around the major leagues, what advice would you give to aspiring athletes hoping to have half the success that you've had? It's just a really big decision about where you choose to go to school. And I don't like to make light of it because I realize that had I not gone to Seton Hall University, there's a really good chance I wouldn't be talking to you two right now. I'd be somewhere else. And it probably wouldn't have ended well for me. Um, where we choose to go to school is going to set up all the good stuff that is going to come your way. All the good stuff physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially. Um, so choosing where to go is really important. And, and I can help people navigate that process by, you know, sharing how you might go about picking a school or having them pick you. All right, that'll uh, wrap it up. I appreciate you joining the show here, John. Well, Thomas and Lily, thank you for having me. I hope I get a chance to see you guys down the road. So, Lily, what did you think of uh, John Morris, you know, be, being able to spend some time with him? Being able to spend some time with John Morris was actually really nice because he gave great advice that I took away from and that I can use. And he was also really sweet, and it's going to be really nice when everyone can be able to talk to him like the way I did. Right. In early October, we're going to be hosting a conversation with John Morris on a Zoom for students, faculty, and parents to join, where John will share some of his stories from the major leagues and his advice for young athletes looking to continue their playing careers in college and for people looking for success in life. He grew up in our community, and he's had some amazing life experiences to share. So keep an eye out for that on our BNB shows. But now for another one of those new features we told you about. You loved him on the street, and now you'll give him a minute to cover the world of sports in the Matt Mano Minute. Start the clock. I'm Matt Mano here with the Fast Minute in Sports. I'll set the clock. The Mets have always been a punchline, and maybe I'm a bit biased, but that's primed to change in 2021. They still have Jacob deGrom, the best pitcher in baseball. Him and a healthy Noah Syndergaard lead what could be a top five rotation in baseball if Rick Porcello can get even close to his 2016 form and David Peterson can continue to develop. Not only that, but the bullpen is primed to bounce back. If we're smart, Edwin Diaz can be moved to a 7th or 8th inning role where there's less pressure, which means Seth Lugo can get back to being the closer the Mets need him to be. And let's not forget about the bats. Headlined by the two-headed monster at first, a Pete Alonso and Dom Smith, the elite Michael Conforto, and Jeff McNeil, who quietly hit 320 in 2020. The Mets lineup is one of the best in baseball. And the final piece of the Amazons puzzle, the front office. Gone are the days of the Wilpon. Steve Cohen has officially agreed to buy the New York Mets. You already know City Field will be rocking in 2021, if we're allowed in. And I don't know about you, but I can't wait. Let's go Mets. This has been the fastest minute in sports. I'm Matt Mano. Now back to you in the studio. That will just about wrap things up for the first episode of Season 4 here on Sports Talk. Make sure to follow our social media for all the latest updates and much more. For Matt Mano, I'm Tom Morrow. And I'm Malia Pez. And remember, we're always talking sports. <laughs>